All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, my name is Martha Stroud. I'm the Associate Director and Senior Research Officer at the USC Shoah Foundation Center for Advanced Genocide Research. Thank you all so much for coming. We hope this finds you well, safe, and healthy wherever you are watching from in the world. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce the director of the center who will introduce our speaker for today. So I will pass it over to Wolf Gruner, who is the founding director of the center and a professor of history at USC. Thank you so much, uh, Martha, and uh, I second uh, you're welcome to our audience, uh, especially in, this, in these difficult times. So thank you all for uh, attending this lecture. Um, the Center for Advanced Genocide Research was founded in 2014 and uh, has an uh, academic program which consists of annual conferences, um, uh, events like this one, and also a fellowship program. And if you want to know more, you can go to our webpage, uh, Center for Advanced Genocide Research at the USC Shaw Foundation, uh, or also uh, subscribe to our newsletter. So I also wanted to uh, take the uh, uh, opportunity to thank our co-sponsor, the U USC Institute of Armenian Studies, who is uh, helping with mounting the lecture. And uh, now I'm coming uh, to my uh, distinct pleasure to introduce our speaker for today, uh, Dr. Mehmet Polatel, who is currently a junior postdoctoral research fellow at the Center for Advanced Genocide Research. He received his PhD uh, in modern Turkish history from Bokacici University in Istanbul in 2017. Uh, on with the topic or the title of his dissertation is Armenians and the Land Questions in the Ottoman Empire, 1870 till 1940. For this dissertation uh, research, he received the Society for Armenian uh, Studies Distinguished Dissertation Award for uh, uh, 2015 and 2017. Before his dissertation, he got a uh, BA in International Relations from the University of Middle East Technical University in 2007, and a Master's in Comparative Studies in History and Society from Koch University in Istanbul in 2009. He, is, uh, uh, he was a postdoctoral fellow in Armenian Studies uh, at the University of Michigan and Arbor before he came uh, as a postdoc to the Center for Advanced Genocide Research. His main research interests are state society uh, relations, socioeconomic history, obviously the Armenian genocide and the dispossession of Armenian property. Um, and remarkable about his uh, academic uh, career is um, that he already, before he even uh, finished his PhD, he co-authored an important book together with uh, Ur Unger entitled The Confiscation and Destruction, Young Turk Seizure of Armenian Properties, published with Bloomsbury in 2011. Beyond that, he already published several articles and book chapters on the Armenian massacres, the land question, and the Armenian genocide. Today's uh, topic uh, of the lecture is uh, the topic of his postdoctoral research, uh, which is connecting two uh, events of mass violence in the uh, Ottoman and Armenian history, the Hamidian massacres and the Armenian genocide. And uh, with this connection, he is one of the kind of at the forefront of a new research trend to uh, co connecting these two uh, events of mass violence which were separated uh, until now uh, in uh, academic research. So it's my distinct pleasure to hand over to Mehmet Polatel. Thank you all. Thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I would like to thank you all for joining this event. I also want to thank the Shaw Foundation Center for uh, Advanced Gen uh, Genocide Research for hosting me as a postdoctoral fellow and for giving me this opportunity. Uh, specifically, I want to thank its director, uh, Wolf Gruner, and uh, to all my colleagues here, including Marta Stroth and Vademir Vidic for their support and friendship. Uh, I want to express my gratitude to my colleague and friend, Manuk Avedikian, who helped me greatly in navigating this uh, archive. 
Last but not the least, uh, uh, the Institute of Armenian Studies uh, is the co-sponsor of this event and uh, I'm also grateful uh, and thankful to them uh, and its director, Sarpi Kazarian. So as you see on my uh, the title of my talk, uh, I will uh, talk about my current research, research project, which focuses on uh, the relationship between these two events, the Hamidian massacres and the Armenian genocide. This talk, uh, I will also talk about testimonies in the Vis uh, Visual History Archives of the Shoah Foundation and uh, my work in this particular uh, uh, archive. The Hamidi massacres were a series of mass violence that took place in the years between 1894 and 1897 and costed the lives of more than 100,000 Armenians. The Armenian genocide happened almost 20 years later. later. <clears throat> and around a million Armenians were killed in this genocide. These are both well-known events and the scholarship on both of these events has been developing significantly in recent years. On the other hand, Despite the recent development of scholarship on a number of directions, debates concerning the links between the Hamidian massacres and the genocide have remained limited to discussions over the intentions of the central government. More specifically to the question of whether the Hamidian massacres were a prelude to the genocide or not. As noted by various scholars, there were significant differences between the Hamidian period and the constitutional period and the prelude approach marginalized the fact that there were a peri period in between, that is the initial aftermath of the constitutional revolution of 1908, when the establishment of an inclusive regime and alternative future was seen as possible by many actors. And I fully agree with these points. However, I think that the relationship between these two events deserves further scrutiny, because we cannot ignore the fact that there were a series of massacres that caused us costed the lives of hundreds of thousands of Armenians and changed the demographic composition of population in many localities just two decades before the genocide. I think we can get a larger understanding of these events and their relationship by decentralizing our focus and shifting our gaze from Istanbul and the actions and intentions of the central government to what was happening at the local level. Who were directly involved in mass violence in these events? which actors or groups profited from them. How did the enormous property transfers that accompanied the massacres impacted later developments? What were the elements of public debates at the local level in these two periods? Were there overlaps between the locations of massacres? I think such new questions can help us get a more nuanced and comprehensive understanding of the relationship between these two periods. And this is what I have been trying to do in this project, which focuses on the perpetrators, beneficiaries, and conflicts over material resources like land. The geographical focus of my project is the Ottoman East. I chose to focus on this particular region because it has some particular characteristics, both in terms of the Hamidian massacres and the genocide. The massacres of 1894 and 1897 had concentrated on the interior and eastern provinces of the empire. Moreover, in some eastern provinces like Bitlis or Van, order was never fully restored and the massacre per period was followed by what was called the years of terror by local Armenians. Secondly, during and after the massacres, there was a tremendous process of property transfer from Armenians to Muslims. In my PhD dissertation, I studied how this process transformed the characteristics and the extent of the Armenian land question. That is the question of what would happen to the seized properties of Armenians. And my research shows that these seizures also concentrated in this region. As you see on this map uh, that I prepared on the basis of a report prepared by the Armenian Patriarchate Commission established in 1908, there is a geographical distribution. It is the geographical distribution of significantly valuable properties seized by force. Of course, these are not all uh, seized properties. As you can see, there's a clear concentration in the eastern provinces of the empire. In some provinces, for example, in Harput, Van, and Bitlis, the sum of disputed Armenian lands was more than half of the total area under cultivation in the province. 
because this was a massive problem in some places in this region. And uh, this was a very important issue because agriculture and animal husbandry were the main socioeconomic activities of uh, people in this parts of the Ottoman Empire. And land was the main factor of production for both of these activities. Finally, this region also has some particular characteristics in terms of the genocide. In some localities, there were almost no deportations because there were on-site massacres. This was the case in Bitlis and Diyarbakir, for example. As you can see in this map prepared by the Gomidas Institute, the survival rate was also very low in these provinces. Moreover, secondary literature, state documents, as well as memoirs and other archival materials show us that local participation in the genocide had some unique characteristics in these provinces because those who took part in this on-site massacres were not only soldiers, but also local people. Thus, this region or localities in this region are good places to study the issues of local participation or the relationship between the Hamidi massacres and the genocide. For my dissertation research, I had prepared a data set concerning local actors involved in the seizure of Armenian properties in the Hamidian period on the basis of documents in the Ottoman and British archives and documents, reports, and books written by Armenian institutions and individuals. In my current research, I have been building on this data set, collecting data about people who participated in the massacres from different archives. I also started working on another data set about local actors who participated in the genocide. What brought me to the Shoah Foundation Visual History Archive was my desire to include the testimonies of survivors to the scope of this research. I thought that the testimonies could help me in two main ways in this research. As my research with these sources had two objectives. First, I wanted to examine these sources to get an understanding of survivors' own experiences of these events and to see their perspectives concerning the issues of Hamidi massacres, land disputes, and material motivations of perpetrators. Documents in state archives or documents prepared by or submitted to institutions rarely provide an opportunity for this. My second objective was to enrich the empirical data, data about local dynamics and the relationships of people that, was, uh, that I was gathering with the help of survivor testimonies. This is an ongoing project, but I want to provide a very brief overview of what I have found so far. My research shows that during the massacres, there had emerged a very large interest group who had benefited from the processes of property and land seizure. <laughs> These include local power holders, that is, actors like Az, base, religious authorities, and tribe leaders. But these were not the sole beneficiaries or usurpers. There were also people of more limited means who had seized lands or extended the borders of their fields at the expense of their Armenian neighbors. This includes locals, nomadic and settled Kurds, and Muslim immigrants, in most cases, Circassians. After 1908, the resolution of the Armenian land question had become a possibility because of the shift in the political context. And this had co caused considerable escalation of tension and resistance on the ground. Many local power holders who had taken part in the Hamidian massacres and increase their wealth and power in this process had found different ways to assert their positions on this matter. Some had petitioned the government, some others had published threatening articles, others had frequented the offices of local governors, pressuring them to resist possible attempts for the return of these lands in line with the reform framework that was being established in 1914. There were also small and large scale rebellions. Just before the genocide, Actors who remain at odds with the government, mainly because of this issue or because of events and developments related to this issue, were officially pardoned by the government. Thus, there was the, this final phase of rapprochement between the state and local power holders on the eve of the genocide. In terms of local actors who carried out important tasks in genocide operations during the war, there were significant continuities. In other words, there were countless matches between my Hamidian massacres and seizure data set and genocide data set. The personal histories or family stories of many people who took part in the administrative supervision of the seizure and distribution of Armenian properties during the genocide 
or personal or family stories of many perpetrators who participated in or led the massacres in their respective regions were linked with the earlier massacres and seizures. The findings of my research so far indicate that socioeconomic concerns and competition over resources, which had gained a new character after the Hamidin massacres, were important factors conditioning local participation during the genocide. After this general overview of my find findings so far, I want to talk a bit about the specifics of my research at the Visual History Archive and how studying the testimonies in this archive impacted the course of my research and my understanding of the issue. Here I have studied more than 100 uh, testimonies in two collections. One of them is the Armenian Film uh, Foundation uh, collection. And the materials in this collection are mostly in the video format and they are uh, thoroughly indexed. This provides a considerable degree of convenience for research because you can easily identify the specific sections of interviews that are relevant for uh, your topic. In my research in this collection, I made use of various index terms, including Hamidi massacres, looting, stealing, property seizure, as well as deportation orders. The second collection that I have studied is the Richard Ovanistian uh, Oral History Collection. The material in this collection are uh, audio files, and uh, I also work, uh, work with the transcripts of these audio files. And these materials is uh, not uh, totally uh, indexed. They are in the process of being indexed at the moment. Uh, but I've been benefited a lot from uh, studying this particular collection because these interviews have an oral history format that include inquiries about pre-genocide period and uh, pre-genocide pre period, the massacres, and also the post-genocide uh, context. Of course, working with testimonies has these uh, challenges. And I have also experienced some of them. Although I had some experience in conducting oral history research, this was the first time I engaged with genocide testimonies on a continuous basis. In terms of their impact on the researcher, these materials are very different from state documents because they reveal the extent to which these events of mass violence shatter the worlds of people on a personal basis. Another challenge that occurs in such research is very much related to the basic fact that testifying is a practice of the living, of the survivors. But survivors rarely constitute a representative sample of all people targeted in a genocide. Thus, the experiences of whom Pirimo Levi calls the drown, the experiences of people who did not survive, remains beyond our uh, grasps. In the case that I have been studying, there was a geographical differentiation in this regard. In some places, like the Bitlis town, there were only a handful of survivors. Accordingly, we have very few testimonies from these places. And in these cases, it is rather difficult to get a sense of what happened in different parts of the provinces, province on the basis of testimonies alone. For this project, this did not become a major obstacle because I had the opportunity to use data triangulation methods to enrich the findings due to the design of this particular study. Another challenge of working with genocide testimonies is related to the fact that genocides often result in the uprooting of people. In other words, in various cases of genocidal violence, people find themselves in unfamiliar social and physical environments. And this sometimes makes it difficult for them to identify perpetrators or, or places. I came across uh, many example, uh, sev uh, several examples of this. There were many testimonies in which the actors could only be identified as a Kurd or Turk or as a group of Kurds or Turks. But I must, also note, I must also note that there are also interviews in which certain people were identified on a specific basis. Finally, most of the interviewees whose testimonies are in these uh, two collections were children during the genocide. Working with testimonies of survivors who were children during the genocide can be uh, challenging, especially if they were very little at the time of the genocide. In these cases, survivors may not remember many details. On the other hand, these testimonies can also provide unique uh, insight. In terms of the testimonies that I have examined, there were many children who were taken into Kurdish or Turkish uh, families. Many of them were kidnapped or sheltered for material interests to carry out agricultural work, to take care of animals or to do domestic chores. 
In some cases, these children remained in these places for long periods of long periods of time, and their testimonies provide unique insight concerning the genocide and it is aftermath at the local level. Uh, there are a number of important insights that I have uh, derived from studying these testimonies. First of all, these testimonies show that show that uh, the Hamidi massacres were a very important event for many people. As I noted, in these massacres, more than 100,000 Armenians were killed. In these testimonies, I came across the personal losses that this event caused. Many people had lost their parents, grandparents, or uncles. Some had grown up in the orphanages. Others had lost their family homes or lands. These massacres were often used as temporal markers upon which personal histories were placed. For example, many survivors talk about their time of birth with reference to massacres by saying things like, I was born two years before or five years after the massacres. They also underscore uh, that the massacres and plunder that accompanied them were frequently narrated among uh, Armenians before the genocide. Thus, these testimonies show that the massacres were a defining period for Armenians in uh, many localities. The testimony of Harutun Ayvazyan uh, in the Armenian Film Foundation collection provides important insight concerning this issue because, as you see, he underlines that the use of massacres as temporal markers was a common practice in Maresh before the uh, before the genocide. Studying these testimonies, uh, I saw that themes like the land question, plunder, and access to natural resources like water uh, were also important elements of the narratives of, uh, narratives of survivors. Many survivors, even those who were children at the time of the genocide, had detailed knowledge concerning the socioeconomic life in their localities and the dynamics of land question at the local level. This was most probably uh, related to the fact that in the rural areas, children were often a part of a part of the production process and personally worked in the fields despite their young age. For many survivors, the land question was a personal issue because their families had lost their lands or, lands or animals during or after the Hamidian massacres and this had impacted their uh, living conditions in a major way. Many families had become significantly impoverished because of these processes. And these testimonies provide us unique insights to understand the personal impact of these issues and how they were actually experienced by uh, individuals. As I noted, the matches between the main beneficiaries of the processes of property transfer and people who directly participated or coordinated the massacres during the genocide at the local level indicate that material interests might have played an important role in shaping the unfolding of genocide on the ground. The prospects of keeping the lands that they had seized in the previous period or the prospect of seizing new lands and thus increasing their wealth and power might have motivated many local power holders in these uh, actions. The testimonies of various survivors support the conclusion that material interest and competition over resources were important factors shaping the behavior of local power holders before, during, and after the genocide. For example, Bogos Kolostian, Kalust, uh, Bogos Kalu, Kalustian a survivor from the Tadem village of uh, Harput was 15 years old during the genocide. In his village, all adult men were killed, but many younger males had survived because the local notables or the Aas, who were tasked with supervising the deportation and massacres in the region were also large land uh, landowners who had seized many Armenian properties during the Hamidian massacres and during the genocide, and they simply needed people to toil these lands and to harvest. Because of this, because they had bought land and people who could be used as unpaid labor, they would clearly become very rich. Kalustian notes that this had caused jealousy on the part of other Muslims who reported this situation to the government and that there was another wave of violence, this time targeting children following uh, this incident. As seen in this case, at the local level, Socioeconomic concerns and competition over material resources were important factors shaping the unfolding of the genocide at the local level. 
As I noted, many children were spared from deportation or uh, massacres and distributed among Turkish or Kurdish families to work as unpaid laborers. Some of them worked in the fields, some grazed sheep, some worked as servants in households. Some of these testimonies indicate that some of these children were also used for determining which lands belonged to which Armenian families before the genocide by people who took them into their households. This seems to be done to facilitate the distribution of these nearly seized properties among the locals. In the testimonies of survivors who worked as unpaid laborers after the genocide, the specifics of their labor and working conditions have a significant place. In some cases, their memory of this specific time period is confined to these issues. After these uh, elaborations, I want to talk a bit about two specific cases and how studying these testimonies helped me in tracing the links between the Hamidin massacres and the genocide in terms of perpetrators. In order to do this, I must go into detail, uh, I must go into detail a bit because this is the only way I, I can highlight the extent to which these testimonies contribute to this project. One of the cases that I want to uh, mention here uh, is a village in Harput named Tadam, or today's name is Tadam. By 1914, 1300 Armenians and around 60 Muslims were living in this village. Before my research with the testimonies, I had some information I had some information regarding the events and actors in this locality because there are documents about them in the British, Ottoman and Armenian sources, and, but my knowledge was very fragmentary. The data I had back then was not enough to get a general picture of relationship and patterns. It was all bits and pieces. At the VHA, the Visual History Archive, there are three testimonies from this village. The names of the survivors are Yegisabeth Terzian, Bogos Kalustian and uh, Miss Eloyan, whose first name was not specified. And thanks to these testimonies, I found a chance to get a larger understanding of these relationships and patterns at the local level because all of these survivors had provided various important uh, details. Starting with the data that I had. From the British Consular reports, I knew that a person named Haji Bey and his son Hafiz were important actors shaping the course of massacres in this locality in the Hamidim period. During the massacres, 270 Armenians were killed. The majority of women in this village were sexually assaulted during the massacre and many were distributed among Kurds and Turks in the region. And Hafiz and Haji Bey were identified as the primary culprits of this episode of mass violence at the level of this village. Hafiz was also one of the people in my initial data set because there was an entry about one of the seizures he carried out in one of the reports prepared by the Armenian Patriarchate uh, Commission. I also had documents about seizures carried out by an Ahmed in the same region in the Hamidim period. And I had also seen documents from the Ottoman archive concerning operations and seizures led by a person named Bekir during and after the uh, genocide period. Actually, this is one of the uh, uh, documents. This is a complaint, complaint petition written by the surviving Armenians of Tadam in the years of armistice. With this petition, the peasants also demanded return of their lands uh, seized by this uh, Bekir. At the course of this research project at the VHA and uh, working with the testimonies, I became aware that <clears throat> all of these men were members of a large family group, Haji Bey Oğulları or Haji Bey Zade, and that individuals from this group were actually involved in later processes of mass violence and seizures in different ways. Because the survivors had stayed with different members of this family group for prolonged periods of time, they had knowledge about who was who and who had done what. And thanks to the information that they provided, I was able to get a much thicker understanding of the events and actors in the locality. Data triangulation that are carried out after examining these testimonies shows that members of this family group had seized various lands in this region during and after the Hamidian massacres, and that they were actively engaged in the coordination and implementation of genocidal operations in 1915. The soldiers had seized the village in 1915, 
under the command of Hafiz. And his house was used as the place for the gathering of Armenians to be deported. In the case of people gathered in this way, deportation was not a long journey because many of them were killed within Harput. In this process, conversion affairs, which were mandatory for the stay of surviving Armenian children, were carried out in the house of Ahmed. In this period, various members of this family group, family group had seized new lands belong, belonging to Armenians and used the labor of surviving Armenian children to cultivate and harvest these lands. When follow-up orders came for the liquidation of all Armenians in these localities, they had also participated in the second round of genocidal violence that targeted the surviving and converted Armenian youth and women. Only a couple of children had survived this later episode, and they continued to be used by the same actors as unpaid labor for agricultural work. This case provides a very important insight concerning the relationship between the Hamidi massacres and the genocide and about the importance of material motives and competition over resources in shaping the actions of local power holders. And without the testimonies of these three survivors, I would not, uh, I would not be able to reach this findings. Another case that I want to mention here is the case of Charsanjak. Uh, this is the uh, period, the center, uh, central town of uh, Charsanjak district. Uh, which was a district of Harput, and uh, Charsanjak was a much uh, larger place, inhabited by almost 6,000 Armenians and 4,000 Muslims in over 40 villages. And I have been collecting documents from different archives about this place for some time because there was a very large scale and prolonged land dispute in this locality. The land dispute in this district had begun in the mid 19th century at the course of changes in the land regime in the Ottoman Empire. In this period, the base or notables of Charsanjak, led by Isak Bey, had attempted to register all lands in, this, in, in the district in their own names, arguing that they had ancient rights over these lands, which were given to the control of their ascendants. Thousands of Armenian peasants who were cultivating these lands had resisted these attempts, claiming that they also had ancient rights as tillers of the soil. In the 1870s, the Council of State had given a de decision in favor of peasants. But this decision taken by the central government at the time of political crisis was not implemented at the local level and was later retracted. In the context of the Hamidian massacres, the bar uh, bargaining position of the peasant had weakened considerably and the base had achieved to consolidate their power and influence by controlling Kurdish irregulars and by exerting violence and pressure via this control. Isaac, uh, Osman, Arslan and Ismail were all uh, involved in this process of mass violence uh, during the Hamidin massacres. However, towards the end of the 19th century, just when they had consolidated power over Armenian peasants, these uh, certain baits or uh, notables had begun to fight among themselves. Thus, there was this period of intra-family feud within Isaac Bey's family, and this resulted in the imprisonment of all his sons, Ismail Arslan and uh, Sherif. And as Isaac Bey himself died in this period, his brother Osman and his son Ahmed had taken control of the disputed lands. With the general amnesty that was declared after the revolution of 1908, Isaac Bey's sons were released. Around the same time, Armenian peasants of this district had begun to submit collective petitions and to make demonstrations demanding the recognition of their rights over the lands. And Ottoman and British documents suggest that these efforts were also supported by Arslan Bey, who had probably changed his position on this matter due to being marginalized in the previous years when other members of his family increased their power at his expense. At the Visual History Archive, there are uh, various testimonies by Armenians from this area. And these sources helped me deepen my understanding of this case in a considerable way. Uh, as I said before this research, I had an understanding of these people and these events, but this was mostly based on documents written by people like state officials, foreign councils, or Armenian politicians, intellectuals, as well as peasants. 
Here I found the chance to look at this case by taking an additional perspective into account that is the perspective of genocide survivors. Thanks to the uh, documents of documents in state archives, I knew that these baits were very powerful. What I did not know was how this situation actually impacted uh, people's lives or what they had experienced at the course of these uh, developments. Studying these testimonies, I saw that in the eyes of Armenian survivors, these baits were not only powerful, but also only powerful because they had something like what is called the sovereign power power over life, life and death in political philosophy. In some testimonies, they were referred to as the kings and even gods of Char Sanjak. Secondly, these testimonies helped me get a fuller picture of the land disputes and socioeconomic life in this region. For example, Baghdasar Chitian, a survivor from this region knows the following in his testimony. And I quote, Armenians were agriculturalists. Every house had its vineyard, garden, then fruits. The fields belonging to the us belonged, belonged to the us because they had taken them by force. Every fall, they would come to the village and take their share. Then the government would come and take its share. If there was something left, it was left to be used as seeds for the next year and to be consumed by the family. If not, the young ones in the house would have to go to a different province and work there. With the help of testimonies like Chichijian's, I was able to get a better understanding concerning how this dispute impacted the lives of peasants and what they experienced on the ground. There are some important Publish, published sources like Hushamadians or memory books, such as Kevork Yerevanyan's book on Char Sanjak, which provide important details concerning the genocide period in this locality. Examining the testimonies of survivors along with state documents and secondary sources like this book, I was able to trace the relationships among actors and events in this region. In these testimonies, some individuals like Mahmuta and Feyza are particularly singled out as the bloodiest perpetrators. My research so far indicates that these were men tied to the Isaac Bey, Bey's family. Another individual underlined in this testimony is Ahmet Bey, who was identified as some sort of a coordinator for the massacres that took place during the genocide. For example, uh, Ohannes Dökmecian, the genocide uh, survivor, notes that before the initial massacre in 1915, the perpetrators had gone to Perry to get additional arms and gathered in Ahmed Bey's house and prepared there for the massacre. This information may not mean uh, much in itself, but when we triangulate data derived from different sources, this information becomes very significant because Ahmed Bey was among the members of the Isaac Bey family who increased their control and power after the imprisonment of other members of the family. And in 1909, Armenian peasants had submitted various petitions to the local and central government complaining that this Ahmed uh, had been ordering murders, seizing properties, and sexually assaulting women in the region. What we see with the help of these testimonies is that this very same individual had played a crucial role in the coordination and, reality, uh, and implementation of massacres during the genocide. So in this talk, talk, I try to outline the highlights of my research, research so far, and the specifics of the research that I have been carrying out at the uh, center. In my case, the process was kind of similar to looking for the needles in a haystack, but this proved to be a very rewarding effort, efforts because I actually found uh, many, uh, and this research contributed greatly to my ef uh, efforts to trace the relationship between the Hamidin massacres and the genocide in terms of perpetrators, beneficiaries, and material uh, motives. And I am sure that the materials in these archives can contribute greatly to many other researchers who examine different aspects of this case. And uh, thank you very much for listening to my lecture. Thank you so much, Mehmet. I'm sure if everybody were not on mute, they would all be uh, applauding along with me. Thank you so much.
Okay. Um, and there are many thank yous and great jobs and praise in the chat. So um, we would like to open it up now for discussion and for any questions or comments you have. So if you do have a question or a comment, please click the participants button in your Zoom controls. And then on the left hand side, you'll see a raise hand uh, button. And so please raise your hand and we'll call on you um, and unmute you to ask your question. And if we turned off your video at the beginning of the lecture, um, feel free to turn that back on yourselves. I believe you can control that, but we will control the muting. Before we launch into this section, I wanna add our thanks to Mehmet's to the USC Institute of Armenian Studies who are co-sponsoring the lecture. Um, the Institute is an incredible partner for our center and we're so happy to partner with them on this event. In the chat, if you scroll back in the chat, you'll see some links to the center website, to the Institute of Armenian Studies website, as well as a link to a podcast produced by the Institute of Armenian Studies with the Institute's director, Salpi Hazarian, uh, a podcast which was an interview with Dr. Polatel, um, which hopefully you will enjoy. All right, so we have some hands raised. I'm going to start with Al Isayan, and apologies in advance if I um, mispronounce your name. No worries, it's Isayan. Um, Dr. Politel, great presentation. I am uh, curious um, how many of these families of the perpet perpetrators have you been able to trace to current? contemporary um, either uh, large families or um, government uh, officials in, in contemporary Turkey? Like how much of these land and wealth, um, uh, stealing of these land and, uh, and wealth from Armenians ended up creating the new uh, oligarchs of current day Turkey? Thank you. So I'm answering right away, Marta, right? Yeah, okay, thank you for the question. So uh, uh, for now, I'm just uh, trying to uh, collect or uh, to collect the data about uh, perpetrators uh, or uh, those uh, people who seize the properties uh, before and uh, during the genocide. So uh, I, right now, I, I don't have the concrete uh, numbers, but it is, in, for instance, in the uh, Armenian uh, Patriarchate Commission's reports for the uh, Hamidian period for the seizures of uh, Armenian properties, we are talking about uh, over 7,000 cases. And sometimes uh, the names of uh, persons who seized these properties were not identified, but we are talking about more than uh, uh, hundreds of uh, names, and so I'm trying to tracing their names. So, of course, I don't know the, uh, I can't say uh, about the exact number of uh, people who became oligarchs after the Republican uh, period. But, of course, we are talking about many um, people. All right, thank you for that. All right, now, Narag. Seferian? Yes. Hello. Thank you. Hello, Dr. Palatel Mehmet. Very nice to see you in this way as well. Thank you very much for your presentation. I was wondering about details in the 1890s. So talking about local notables, Bays and Oz, or talking about uh, maybe recent arrivals from the Caucasus or the Balkans, that's a part of the dynamic when it comes to property seizures and reallocations. But I was wondering if there was also the case of the settlement of traditional nomadic tribal groups. I don't know if this was a longer term process or if it played a part at all, and if it was something that was coordinated 
by the state, perhaps a motivating factor for the 1890s massacres. Thank you. So, uh, sorry, Narek. Uh, first of all, thank you for the question. You are asking about the settlement of nomadics, right? Not the immigrants or emigrants. So I'm uh, concerned that you are asking about the settlement of nomadics. Of course, it is uh, the nomadic tribes uh, and semi uh, semi nomadic tribes uh, were being settled, uh, forcibly settled, starting from the Tanzimat uh, era or the uh, early 19th century, and there were several uh, cases. In my cases, uh, of course, there are some uh, tribes, especially in the Itlis and Mush area. Uh, area that uh, seized or uh, joined in this uh, land disputes. For instance, in the Sassoon area, uh, the, the, the discussion or disputes was not just about the settlement of uh, those nomadic tribes in the Armenian villages, but it is about the usage of uh, pastures because those uh, nomadic tribes uh, wanted to use uh, these uh, lands around the Armenian uh, villages as their pastures for their uh, uh, animal husbandry, uh, 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 animal husbandry. But what we uh, see is that actually these were after the, the, the land transformation, the uh, changes in the land re regime, these pastures actually became the part of our Armenian uh, village uh, ownership. So it created this kind of problems. During the Hamidian massacres, uh, I think of course, some uh, tribes, uh, especially under the Hamidian regimes that was established by the uh, state uh, to uh, not just the, uh, uh, the Armenian uh, issue, but also for uh, against uh, Russia. There were several uh, uh, tribes uh, under these uh, regimes and they joined the uh, seizures and there are several names of uh, tribes, of course, uh, in the list of Armenian Patriarchate and also in my data set. Yeah, that is it. Okay. Um, Manuk, I assume this is you. <laughs> do you have your hand raised? Yes, I do. Yes, I do. Welcome. Uh, I, I guess I can put my video. Um, hi, Mehmet. Um, oh, gosh, let me get the come on shop players out. Um, I, well, I had a question. Um, thank you for your uh, fantastic lecture. Um, I had two questions, but I'm going to ask you one. Um, you had mentioned Arslan Bey in Char, like in Char Sanjak, and I remember when you told me about Ohannes Dökmedjan's interview. It was a fantastic interview that that you, that that you discovered. Um, I wanted to ask, uh, he, since he was considered a god in in uh, in Khartert and the and his fiefdoms north of it in Charsanjak, what um, do you know what his role in relationship to the republican government was in the some years later? Is there any documentation? I know it's outside your like outside your research, but considering he was a god, at least to the survivors, uh, what do you know about him in the ninth, like after the genocide? Thank you, Manuk, uh, for asking this question, and it's good to hear your voice. And I remember that when I listened to this testimony, I just called Manuk and uh, because I want to talk about this interview because it is very important. This uh, on this uh, the survivor on this Tekmejian was actually stayed uh, had actually stayed with this Aslan Bey for eight years during the genocide and. He was, of course, uh, kidnapped, or maybe we don't know uh, the actual reason because during the interview of Ernest Dukmejian didn't want to say bad or uh, bad things about him. There are several reasons, I, I think, but the important thing is he, uh, I think Aslan Bey helped him to save his two sisters from uh, other girls who kidnapped. Uh, on his Dukmejian sister, so that is why he didn't want to say uh, bad things. But in some point in the interviews, his wife uh, joined and he kind of talked about this Aslan Bey was the king of the, uh, this Aslan Bey was the king of the uh, Charsanjak. So uh, I think, uh, 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 I'm not uh, for sure, but uh, as far as uh, my research shows, 
he was uh, he actually died in 1922 or 1923 and it is not clear in uh, one ethnic medians testimony but when i look at the other uh, uh his names i couldn't find anything about uh, during the the Republican period, but we know that uh, when we think about this family the large, uh, in a larger way, this family was actually uh, 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 they actually worked with the Republican state in a different phase. They were Sunni tribes and they were kind of, um, for instance, joined the uh, Darsen massacres, uh, Darsen massacres of 1938 and they again uh, became the culprits of this uh, issue, not the Aslan Bey, but the other families. And we know that even in 1916, they were used by the uh, Ottoman state to suppress the Darsim Rebellion in 1916. And they created a militia group and this Sheriff Bey, for instance, uh, became the one of the commanders. So I think they uh, continued working with uh, uh, with, uh, state, but of course, it is not always the case. In some cases, in different cases, for instance, some uh, tribe leaders who joined both Hamidin massacres and uh, the genocide became, uh, they were also targeted in the Republican period by the state uh, in terms of the Kurdish issue. But it is another question and another topic. Thank you. Okay, M Matthew has that again. Uh, <coughs> let me see if I can un. I've been unmuted, but yes. my video can't start. It's oh, been sweet. blocked, but that's okay. I can ask as a disembodied I'll, voice. I'll, I'll get oh, it. Here we go. Yeah. There we go. Thank you very much, Matt. It was a great, uh, a really great lecture and very enlightening. And very cool sources. I have two questions. Uh, one of them is a clarification question, and then the other is about the sources you use. So for the clarification question, uh, you talked about, you know, a couple of families that uh, you were able to kind of piece together the kind of bits of information that you picked up out of Ottoman and Armenian sources elsewhere through these uh, archives, which is really cool. For the, I just wanted to clarify, for example, with the Hajibeu family and some of the others you described, were you tracing that the same family was involved in carrying out violence and distributing properties that had been seized from people who were murdered or dispossessed uh, in both the 1890s and 1915, like that across either the same actors or the same, like different generations of the same family, that there were the same families who were participating in like uh, carrying out violence and seizing property. Did I understand that correctly? Or were you only talking about 1915 or only talking about 1890s? Uh, actually, for uh, this uh, specific uh, uh, districts, I actually looked for the generational, like from 1890s and 1915. What they did this family or uh, all these persons? Because it's also like uh, discussed in the Armenian uh, testimonies like that. They said that Hafuz Bey was already, uh, Hafuz already uh, had killed Armenians in the Armenian massacres and now he, he became the his house became the center for the genocide massacre. So mm -hmm. I also, I am also tracing them in the generation way, but sometimes yeah, I, I only I only find uh, one information about the uh, Hamidin, they role in the Hamidin massacres, but sometimes I found only in the genocidal period, but it's not these two cases. Okay, so it depended case by case, but you did find some examples of that. Yeah. Got it. Okay, thank you for clarifying. And then quickly on the, the sources, I was just curious to what extent the sources in the Visual Historical Archive uh, shed light on the social and economic life of both Armenian and non-Armenian peasants. Uh, I was just curious, you know, you and other authors point out that a lot of like, this was a time of general dispossession as well, that in general, the, condition, the financial and economic conditions of the empire were such that elites, as they often do, were exploiting non-elites, taking their stuff, uh, seizing their land for various reasons. And I just wanted to know to what extent the sources in this archive shed light on this question of, you know, to what extent were Armenians uh, singled out for 
violence and dispossession and to what extent this was a, a general movement of violence and dispossession toward the end of empire uh, as other groups in increasing economic competition with each other were suffering. Thank you, Medjuf. Medjuf. And it's also great to hear your voice. It's been a while. We last met in Istanbul. So, and of course, I know your research too. And this is very, I'm looking forward to uh, uh, it when you finish, uh, finish it. And uh, I know that, uh, so uh, in the uh, uh, research of Anisian uh, uh, colleague, oral history collection, uh, as I said, it is oral history collection, and they ask uh, several questions about the pre genocide period, about starting uh, uh, from uh, the uh, houses, uh, their life in. Uh, village, what they did or their families did in these uh, villages, etc. And of course, they also ask the relationship between Turks or Kurds in this uh, synthesis. And they are very important, uh, actually, they are very, uh, inform uh, there are many information about uh, this socioeconomic life uh, before the uh, genocide. And uh, I only shared from the Chichijian's uh, testimony because it's uh, like half of it uh, almost uh, was about the socioeconomic life and conflict between the, these us and uh, base uh, versus uh, Armenian peasants. There are a little, uh, little uh, information about non-Armenian non-Armenians, unless they were local notables or uh, oppressors, but they mostly uh, talk about. For instance, in some cases, they said that, for instance, uh, Kurds, uh, some Kurd, Kurdish peasants were worked for uh, Armenian families on their uh, agricultural resource or kind of things. And they knew that there, are, uh, there were also Kurdish peasants uh, in the same condition with the Armenian peasants. They gave some uh, comparisons, but it is not, uh, of course, uh, uh, not too detailed, and but as I said, they uh, these testimonies include information about this. And uh, I'm trying to remember the testimonies, but in general, yeah, they are, they are very helpful to understand the socioeconomic dynamic, especially at the local level, because this, uh, of course, it depends on the uh, the testimonies and the interviewers who asked. Right. Uh, questions, but uh, in general, they try to uh, uh, try to include uh, information about this pre-genocide pre socioeconomic life. Sounds rich. Thanks very much. Thank you, Matthew. Okay, um, there are a number of people still with their hands up. I just want to say we are going to get to you. We're planning to continue until at least well till two thirty. So just hang in there if you if you have your hand raised. Um, now I'm gonna go to Daniel Ohanian. I have unmuted you, Daniel. Hi there. Hi. Um, Mehmet, thanks a lot for your talk. Um, I have a connection about connecting um, the work um, and the general thrust of your approach to two other similar things that I know of. Um, and my question is an open one. Um, I'm thinking first of the uh, work of uh, Rupen Safrastian, um, who uh, for a long time has advocated for um, seeing a continuous process of genocide from the 1890s through the 1920s. Um, and I'm also thinking from a different direction of, um, if I'm not misremembering, the report of the Canadian Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which um, decided or asserted or argues that uh, in Canada there has been a centuries long process of cultural genocide against uh, First Nations peoples. Um, so my question Mehmed is in connecting these two events that are usually studied separately, um, how do you think your approaches, uh, sources and the outcomes of your research might uh, be similar to and different from these two other things? So I uh, a 30 year process of genocide and a centuries long process of genocide. Just your thoughts. So thank you, uh, Daniel. 
And uh, I think uh, for the 30 years of the genocide case and the continue to uh, from the Hamidian massacres to genocide, as it's like, uh, as I uh, try to explain in my uh, lecture, that there was a discussion in the uh, literature uh, whether this uh, Hamidi massacres was a prelude to the uh, Armenian genocide. And I think, uh, and I already said, when we look at the uh, macro level or the intention of the uh, central state, there was no any uh, linear process from Hamidi massacres and the genocide because the actors were different. There were several different changes and uh, turning points which uh, might not have uh, went to the uh, genocide direction. But what I was trying to explain in that we should look at the local level because it doesn't, uh, whether it was prelude or not, uh, the important thing is whether there, were, there are uh, different uh, peoples uh, as a perpetrators or as a uh, beneficiaries uh, in both uh, two events. Uh, and uh, I actually, uh, can you uh, clarify the, your question about the Canadian truth? And, uh, I, I couldn't get the connection. Yeah, the, um, the similarity is that I think there too, there is a, a long-term sort of continuity I and mean, people are talking about a centuries long process of genocide, but more importantly um, for me is that in framing it that way, um, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission focused on the uh, victims as opposed to the perpetrators. And so the notion was that although there are different people leading, in fact, I mean, Canada exists since the 1960s, maybe, the eight, maybe 1867, depending on how you look at it, but Canada didn't even exist when, according to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, genocide started. So despite the fact that the government and the governors change, for the Reconciliation Commission, there was a, a, a long process from the victim's perspective. Um, I wonder if that approach is at all attractive to you and if maybe that's where you're headed as well. By looking at the local, things appear continuous, even though from up top, things appear discontinuous. So yeah, thank you uh, for clarification. Now I uh, get the uh, question. So it is, uh, of course, uh, right now, uh, I'm not thinking uh, like that. Of course, it is new way to look at the uh, issue and uh, I will con consider about it uh, right now. I'm not sure uh, whether can we start the genocide from the Hamidin massacres. Of course, it is, uh, 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 we can, of course, uh, accept the uh, Hamidian uh, massacres uh, and accept the wrong, wrong thing without saying that the genocide has been uh, started from uh, this time uh, period. I think the Canadian, can, can, Canadian case is uh, a little bit uh, different, uh, whether I'm not sure how to compare. So uh, I think it's a good question. It's a good uh, thinking point. And uh, uh, actually, I, I don't have the right uh, answer to the right away. All right, we'll move on to the next question. Uh, Gregory, I'm going to unmute you. Hi. Hi. Can you see me? Let's see. I can't see you. I'm trying to send you a prompt to start your video, but we can hear you. Okay. That's now we fine. can so, see you too. Oh, thank you very much. So Dr. Mehmet, um, very riveting lecture, very interesting, uh, sp especially about the details you provided. But in general, how much interest or, and support have you received from the wider audience obviously Armenians, but other organizations um, about this uh, thesis you've written. And have you written a book or are you allowed to write a book? And thank you uh, for the question. And 
Uh, I'm still uh, writing, uh, uh, about, uh, I'm still trying to turn my uh, dissertation into a manuscript. Of course, I'm allowed to uh, write and publish the dissertation uh, as a book. And uh, until now, uh, I, of course, uh, in general, work with the uh, Armenian Studies Institute, uh, Middle Eastern departments, uh, as well as the Shah Foundation. So. So far, I haven't encountered any uh, problem for that. And thank you. Oh. Okay. So, <coughs> have you have you had any pushback from the Turkish government or Turkish communities about your stance uh, in this issue? And not specifically. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Appreciate thank it. Thank you for your question. Okay. Now we'll go to Adi. I'm going to unmute you. I'm trying to unmute you. There you are. You're unmuted. Yes. Hi. I don't know if you can see me. I can hear you. Hi, Dr. Palato. Hello. Um, it was a wonderful lecture. Thank you so much. Um, I'm so glad I was able to join today. My question is about that one map you had. Um, it was about the distribution of forceful seizures of properties. I was wondering if you could just briefly um, answer as to why the areas of Bitlis and Vaughan had such few properties um, seized, whereas when you look at Moosh, Sirt, and Erzurum, there were more. Is there a specific reason why? Or if you could just elaborate on that a bit, please. So uh, first of all, it is uh, because uh, at that time, uh, Moosh has, uh, had a bigger uh, Armenian population in that area, of course, one, two, but uh, I think this is first related to the uh, division of uh, the administrative division of the uh, uh, this period because Mush was actually part of the Bitlis at that time and the north of the the east of the Mush was also part of the one. So I put this uh, based on the current uh, uh, administrative uh, division uh, and. Uh, of course, this is only the uh, cases about the larger than uh, large uh, properties. There are also other uh, volumes. And again, uh, there are several examples from uh, Mush. Uh, I think it is related to the local condition about that because there are several uh, independent small uh, uh, tribes and also sheikhs in this, this area who participated in the uh, land seizures and uh, also uh, in, the, in this uh, massacre. So it, it might be related to that, but uh, uh, I'm still actually, uh, I was also asked this question before and uh, I'm still trying to figure out the specifics of this region. And it might also relate it to, to this, uh, 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 the as I said, this is the properties larger than uh, 10 hectares. Mm -hmm. So uh, because of that, maybe in the in one, uh, the properties that uh, smaller than this uh, amount uh, might not be, might uh, have not been uh, cited in this uh, report. Because we know that the commission member, Kevin Dargaravetian, uh, criticized the report in general saying that they actually didn't include the small scale uh, lands in their reports and he wrote separate book about it. So still I'm trying to uh, understand why Mush became mm -hmm. a center for these seizures. Thank you for the question. Okay. Thank you. I'm from, my ancestors are from Vaughan. That's why this was specifically very interesting for me. So thank you. Welcome. Thank you for coming. All right, I'm going to call on John. Let me unmute you. John? Yes. Welcome. Thank you. I have just to add a, cl uh, a clarification. Uh, the doctor mentioned Miss Yagoyan. Her first name is Elmas. Elmas, okay, thank you very much. Her, her maiden name is Marganian. Her married name is Yagoyan. She's our grandmother. Oh, how wonderful. Uh, thank you. Thank you for the Most welcome clarification. and for your beautiful lecture. Thank you. Thank you for the clarification. 
Thank you. Thank you so much for coming. Okay. Bram? Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. All right. So uh, I actually have uh, one uh, question, and then I kind of have this food for thought. Um, my question would be, you know, which we never really talk about. I'm having. Are you there? Yeah, yeah I'm here. Looks like you muted. Okay. You got muted in the middle of your question, but you, right, can, you, can, are you there? we can hear you. Yeah, so uh, one thing, um, one question, another one for food for thought. So question is, you know, we always talk about, you know, different aspects of the genocide. We kind of pinpoint on a macroscopic level and then we pull back. Well, one, I would like to hear your idea of the first point of conflict uh, between the Armenians and the, and the Turks in the region. And um, from what I'm understanding, or I'm trying to understand something from your lecture, are you saying that this was a, um, uh, an art, was it more driven by Armenian phobia or this anti-Armenian movement supported by national, you know, government support? Or was it um, a gang war? Was this an economic money hungry war that you're talking about on these very, you know, specific pockets throughout Turkey? Uh, because, you know, uh, we continuously, when we're talking about genocides um, or the, the Armenian genocide in specifics, we're talking about the grand agenda. But this is pinpointing now specific groups or families that trace back and i'm trying to understand from your lecture was this a, a national uh, agenda supported uh that was being um, uh, on a local level done by specific groups gang wars against the armenian peasants was it armenian phobia just throughout the entire you know uh empire or what was really happening so the first question as i said is the point first point of conflict is you know where do you see that kind of starting and the rest as I stated. Thank you, Ernan. So, uh, so when I uh, uh, worked on the land question specifically, I started my uh, rotation uh, from mid 19th century because uh, the, the, the Ottoman Empire changed this uh, uh, land le legislation and transformed it is very uh, land, uh, the legal basis uh, about land, allowing people to register their properties in their names. And also that we are talking about centralization process and they uh, try to incorporate the Eastern, uh, incorporate the Eastern provinces into the uh, regime to, uh, 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 so, uh, I think uh, if the, uh, when we talk about the land question, actually it started uh, around this uh, period, the conflict between Armenian peasants versus uh, local notables. And Charles Andrek is, was a good example for this, but there are also other examples because we know that uh, Armenian Patriarchate published report in the 1870s uh, saying that Armenian peasants were uh, dispossessed and forced to leave their uh, villages and uh, but when we uh, look at uh, this process there was a clear uh, uh, class uh, perspective because they were uh, local uh, notables versus Armenian peasants but when we look at the uh, Hamidian period we saw that actually not just the Armenian peasants but also Armenian large, large landowners also were dispossessed and lost their properties uh, as well as uh, being killed uh, in this process. So in that period, the, uh, the issue became more uh, uh, ethnic, uh, especially in the 1890s. Of course, uh, as in all the cases, the lower uh, classes uh, affected uh, horribly in this process, but it, it, we know that there were also other uh, like large Armenian, large landowners uh, were also targeted no. in this process. So uh, I, 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 I'm not sure about the first point of conflict, but we can say that it's uh, escalated. But I'm, uh, I'm not saying that the, the only reason is the land disputes. There are several different uh, motivations uh, or reasons that uh, caused this uh, 
all Armenian uh, questions and uh, issues and all have uh, contributed to, to contribute different, differently. And I'm just uh, trying to contribute this uh, debate by uh, adding this socioeconomic and this land uh, uh, disputes uh, into this uh, literature and putting them as a new uh, motive for this people because when the government decided to for instance kill armenians in the armenian uh, during the genocide they uh, easily uh, found the, the willing executioners on the in the area because as i said especially after 1908 all these land disputes uh, escalated uh, or exer exacerbated the tension among different groups in especially in these eastern provinces and the government easily incorporate and approach these uh, persons and then use them, not use them, but uh, make them uh, executioner in the genocide. Okay, thank you. Thank you. All right, we still have a hand and a couple of questions from chat. So I will call on, the username is Melissa B. Khalil. I think it's probably Melissa. Melissa, <laughs> trying to Hi. read. Hi, uh, Melissa and the last names together with it. So it's oh, thank Melis. you. Sorry about that. Thank you for the lecture, Dr. Palatel. Uh, the Adana massacres were mentioned in one of the quotes, but I don't know if I missed if you went into it in a little more detail. Where do you position Adana massacres of 1909? Is it too strictly local or is it just that this lecture is too short to go into any of that? Just briefly, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so uh, yes, uh, one of the uh, survivors mentioned about Adana massacres uh, as a, again, landmark uh, in the, uh, among the locals before the genocide. So of course I didn't go through in detail uh, about Adana massacres in my talk. So there are uh, several uh, discussions about Adana massacres, whether it was local or it was uh, committed by the uh, CUP. There are uh, the Committee of Union and Progress uh, by the central government. Uh, I think uh, now uh, uh, I think that it it first was started by the locals, and we know that the uh, CUP, the Committee of Union and Progress organized uh, uh, the local uh, Committee of Union and Progress joined the massacres, but uh, until now, uh, there are no, no any clear evidence showing that the central government actually organizes massacres. So it started with, uh, started from the locals by the uh, participations of, uh, of local groups from the uh, Committee of Union and Progress, as well as uh, others. And for that, uh, uh, around 20,000 Armenians were killed in this event. Of course, uh, there was also other uh, uh, events happened in the Istanbul, uh, Istanbul against the uh, government. So it was a little bit cut process. And I know that there are now for Pedro Stamatos and working on this issue. And after that, maybe we will have more uh, understanding about this massacre. Thank you. Thank you. I, I was actually wondering if you see it as a part of the continuum between the Hamidian massacres and the genocide or separately. So I don't know, it's not the local area that I am uh, directly looking uh, for this uh, project. As I said, I'm mostly looking for the Eastern provinces. But uh, uh, because there are not uh, the massacres happened in the Adana massacre, actually happened in the later period. And some argued that uh, actually uh, the Adana massacre was kind of part of it, but happened in a later period. But it is uh, different. And uh, uh, I, I don't have specific data about this uh, continuity. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for your questions. Um, so it's almost time to conclude. I'm just going to ask 
Mehmet a couple of questions from the chat, and then I will take us all off mute so we can properly applaud our speaker. It's a sign of a good talk when there's such a lively discussion. So thank you again, Mehmet. Um, one of the questions was, is there a link of an article written by Mehmet regarding his talk and findings? So for this talk, no, I don't have any articles uh, yet. But uh, I uh, wrote several pieces about the land disputes mm -hmm. as a book chapters. Okay, so they might uh, want to look at it. Okay, and then another question somebody wrote, I wonder if an oral history of the perpetrator's descendants could be conducted to examine the motivations of the perpetrators and if they acknowledge their ancestors' involvement in the genocide. Any comments about what a, an oral history of perpetrators' descendants might reveal or whether you think that's a promising avenue? I think, yeah, it, it can be uh, done. Uh, I'm not uh, considering to do that, but it is uh, right now because I'm now dealing with more uh, historical periods. But we know that there are studies, for instance, Dimit Kurt worked uh, on uh, Antep area and he actually talked with the perpetrators' families uh, about the, uh, the unfolding of genocide in the Antep region and he revealed very important information uh, through the descendants of the perpetrators. It's a, a good uh, example of the possibility of uh, uh, talking with perpetrators to get information. It can be, of course, uh, very informative about it, but of course it depends on the uh, area and region. Sometimes it is not easy to make uh, people talk about their family is wrong thing, it is challenging. That's a good idea, of course. All right, wonderful. Well, that brings the questions to a close. So now I wanna thank you, Mehmet, before I unmute everybody, because who knows what's gonna happen when I unmute everybody. Thank you so much for the lecture and thank you again to our partners from the Institute of Armenian Studies at USC. So thank now I'm going to unmute you all and we can thank Mehmet and applaud all together. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.